okay, I think we'll get going because we have a lot of content to cover today. Um, hello, every hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be hosting this webinar today with um, Anne McDonough. Um, my name is Zachary Burt, and I am the Community Outreach and Grants Manager for the DC Preservation League. And I'm joined today by my coworker, Isabel Hausman, who's running the live stream on Facebook. Uh, for those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington, D.C. citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. I have a few things to go over before we get started. First, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors, whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, Antunovich Associates, Bayer Blender Bell, EHT Traceries, Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, and Quint Evans. Thank you for all your dedication to historic preservation in DC. Moving on, we have a few notes on how today's webinar will run. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions, and we will go through them towards the end of the program. For those joining us on Facebook, Isabel, Isabel will be monitoring any questions you might have and sending them our way here on Zoom. And now that we've covered that, I'm so pleased to introduce you all to my co-presenter today. Anne McDonough joined the DC History Center in 2012, serving as Collections Manager and Library and Collections Director prior to becoming Deputy Director in 2020. Her areas of responsibility include research and scholarship, adult programs, youth education, and exhibits. In this capacity, she oversees the content experts in each division and manages the DC History Center's University Advisory Group and the Totman Fellowship, which aims to nurture emerging champions and scholars of DC history and holds a master's in library science with a focus in archives from the University of Maryland. So welcome, Anne. It's good to see you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for bringing the DC History Center into today's webinar. Yeah, definitely. So. Um, how this presentation is going to run today is I'm going to go through the historic designation 101 piece, which is the real procedural piece, which I like the procedural, but maybe it's going to be a little bit of the boring side, but I'll try and make it interesting. And then Anne is going to have some really helpful tips as far as research goes. And I know that's going to be really interesting and exciting. So first of all, as I mentioned, um, as many of you are familiar with, DCPL was founded on Earth Day in 1971, and the mission of DC Preservation League is to preserve, protect, and enhance the historic and built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. And um, of course, we do a lot of programming and tours, um, as many of you are familiar with, and you're sitting at this webinar right now. But a big piece of what we work on is historic designation. Um, and since 1971, we have um, worked on probably north of 150, 160, 170 designations here in the district. And you can find a complete list of those on the DC Historic Sites website if you're interested, and I can send that link out too. So first of all, um, some people might wonder why even designate something in the first place? And that's actually a very good question. Um, many people will point to a sense of place. Um, oftentimes, whether it's a historic district or a historic landmark, um, there's something unique about its character that someone's attracted to. Maybe they, you know, I always think about the Uptown Theater, which was a designation we worked on a couple of years ago. And when I moved to DC and I didn't know a lot of people, I would love going up to and sitting in the balcony and getting a bucket of popcorn. And there was just that sense of place there, right? In the Uptown, it was different than going to an AMC or a Regal or anything like that. Um, designation also allows for community involvement and managing change. Um, it helps ensure compatibility and minimizes the loss of history, both tangible and intangible. So, you know, obviously the Uptown has some great tangible features, that Art Deco, but um, that story I recounted of sitting up in the balcony, that's really very much part of my intangible life I've lived, right? Uh, and the storytelling. Promotes restoration and adaptive reuse. Um, one thing I really enjoy about designation is it allows for, I think it just allows for better design because um, there's a lot of collaboration between the stakeholders and coming to the best design for uh, the neighborhood and the city at large. And it often provides incentives, including tax credits, grants, easements, and waivers from certain building codes. Other reasons are laid out in uh, this place economic study called 24 Reasons that many of you have probably seen. 
at some point. Um, I'll just run through a few of them right now. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's a job creator, um, not only because designation tends to lead to um, interesting neighborhoods that people want to visit restaurants and stores in, but also jobs in um, building rehab. Um, heritage tourism, obviously, many of DC's historic districts like DuPont Circle or 14th Street or Logan Circle, those are the neighborhoods that um, attract a lot of tourists beyond the National Mall. Uh, property values. Um, this one is obviously much discussed in the context of affordable housing. Um, and also property values, you know, preservation and designation has different effects in a city like Washington, D.C. or a city like Detroit or Cleveland. Um, and that's where the property values aspect is very interesting. And that also gets into tax generation. Um, it's obviously very crucial in a lot of cities like these legacy cities I mentioned, like Detroit or Cleveland, um, with uh, that base there. And that also ties into startups, or rather first place of return, often in these cities that have had a lot of disinvestment, like those legacy cities, um, often the first places that um, start to get revitalized after years of disinvestment are the historic districts. And then of course, going along with jobs, you have um, startups and young businesses that um, oftentimes locate in these neighborhoods that have the sense of place. So um, I don't think you can talk about historic designation without talking about um, some of the history of how we got to this point. Um, I like to mention that the first historic district in the country was actually in Charleston in 1931. Um, it was done through a zoning ordinance. Uh, the Supreme Court had upheld zoning ordinances in the 1920s. And so you start to see the proliferation of zoning throughout the country and throughout our cities and towns. And Charleston, um, they were on the front line of this. New Orleans followed shortly thereafter. I believe Alexandria, Virginia had the third um, historic district in the country or third historic preservation ordinance in the 1940s. And then in 1935, the federal government um, made preservation a national policy of you know, recognizing sites, buildings, and objects of, quote, national significance. Um, and this was pretty monumental because if you think about the, the federal government up to this time involved in you know, conservation, it was sites like Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Grand Canyon, and now the government was actually taking an active role in preservation of um, historic sites, not just natural sites. Um, this act eventually led to the creation of the National Historic Landmarks Program in 1960. Um, that's another form of designation, and we'll talk briefly about that later. And then in 1950, also on the cutting edge, was um, the old Georgetown Act that was passed. Um, still to this day, Georgetown has, even though it's a historic district, like a lot of the other historic districts in the city, I guess you could say it's a first among equals. It has its own procedural process to the old Georgetown Board and the Commission of Fine Arts. And then in 1964, um, the DC Joint Committee on Landmarks was established. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this. This is when basically um, the higher ups got together and they thought, what are the most important historic buildings and sites in the district? And this was unique because they actually classified them into three different categories of importance and value. Um, that's a little bit more similar to what you see in the British system of you know, heritage conservation where they classify landmarks. Um, Joint Committee on Landmarks tried to do something along those lines. So you know, something like the White House was a category one, where a church in Logan Circle maybe was a category three. Um, and we're still living with the effects of the Joint Committee on Landmarks because a lot of those became DC inventory or rather all of them became part of the DC inventory and a lot of them were added to the National Register. In 1965, New York City, obviously this was influential, it's the biggest city in the country, um, passed its own preservation ordinance. This was in response to Penn Station being demolished, which you see here on the right, this beautiful Beaux-Arts structure that reminds you of, you know, the baths of Caracalla or something like that in Roman ruins. And they took a wrecking ball to it. And that's when I think people realized that, oh, maybe we should um, protect some of our buildings in our cities. Um, and this is also in the context of urban renewal, which had got started after World War II and the interstate highway system, which had started during the Eisenhower administration. So that led us to um, 1966. And since then, there's obviously been changes to the system. 
But since then, we have had our current historic preservation framework um, that affects the federal, state, tribal, and local levels. We're not going to get too into the weeds here on the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, which has been amended by since then. Um, major amendments were in the 70s, 1980, 1992. But generally speaking, um, it created the National Register of Historic Places. It created state historic preservation officers, which you have probably heard referred to as SHPOs, and tribal historic preservation officers. Um, it created the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which really is the only federal agency that's solely focused on historic preservation, because even the National Park Service focuses on a lot of different areas, but ACHP is focused solely on preservation. It created Section 106, that procedural process that um, stakeholders have to go through when there's a federal undertaking, like a license or federal money being spent to make sure that um, there's going to be proper mitigation and not damage to historic resources. Section 110 lays out responsibilities for federal agencies. It created the Historic Preservation Fund, which funds a lot of programs, local governments throughout the country, and certified local governments. Like DC has a certified local government. We can talk about that in a minute. And then another important piece of information that is tied to designation is the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, this is very much tied into the Federal Historic Rehab Tax Credit, which has been around since 1976. Um, and it's been changed over the years. It was most recently changed in 2017 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But generally speaking, it's a 20% tax credit um, for certified historic structures. And the key piece here is income producing properties. So not for private homeowners, but you know, the classic example I always think of is an old warehouse loft building being converted into condos. That is the kind of project. And if you think about 1976, there's been a lot, you can think about a lot of different projects in the 80s and 90s with these reuse of historic buildings. So really the National Historic Preservation Act was a major change and a big deal in 1966, but really the rehab tax credit has really shaped the built environment in this country since it was passed almost 50 years ago. Um, and oftentimes when there's adaptive reuse and that's a, the other term for rehabilitation, but you know, changing the use of something, this often goes hand in hand with designation. Once the structure is restored um, and been preserved, oftentimes it will get added to the National Register and not to mention that's how you get the tax credits. So then we're gonna jump forward about a decade. In 1978, DC passed its own historic preservation ordinance. Um, and just to reiterate, this is about you know 13 years after New York passed its preservation ordinance. So we're very much in the time frame of when a lot of cities were starting to recognize historic preservation and creating a process for designation. And this law has led to the creation of the Historic Preservation Office with its professional staff that advises the Historic Preservation Review Board. And our Historic Preservation Review Board has nine members that are appointed by the mayor. And um, under NPS standards, they're, you know, they represent historians and archaeologists, architects, architectural historians. There's also citizen members um, and they're three-year terms and they handle historic designation. And if you go to one of their meetings, a big chunk of what they handle on a monthly basis is design review. And we'll talk briefly about that towards the end of my remarks today. Um, and then another piece that's interesting is, although the members are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council, DC is a very special city in the sense that once HPRB designates something, it is designated. It doesn't have to go to the city council, which in a lot of cities, a designation has to go through the city council before it's officially designated. That is a unique aspect of DC's law, and arguably it means DC has a very strong preservation law in that sense. Uh, this 1978 preservation ordinance also created the DC Inventory of Historic Sites. And um, I want to just mention, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit about local designation versus national designation. Um, but another big difference, too, is the property owner consent. DC Inventory does not have owner consent to be added to the DC Inventory. But since 1980, you've needed owner consent to be added to the National Register. And I just remember what I was going to say about local designation versus national designation. And um, something I talk about often with people is that the regulations, the real teeth of historic preservation regulation, that is at the local level. It's not through the National Register. 
is through a local preservation ordinance. And I wanted to find some language on this. So I went to the National Register's website through National Park Service, and they had this quote in there, and I think it's a good one to remember. Listing in the National Register places no federal restrictions or requirements on private property owners. You may do with the property what you wish within the framework of local laws or ordinances. So that there you go right there. It's the local ordinance that really has the teeth. Um, and oftentimes, I shouldn't say often, but every so often you'll see something in the National Register that's been demolished. Because you know if you wanted to really tear something down and it's listed in the National Register, but it's not locally listed or locally protected, the federal government is not gonna stop that from being demolished. They don't have the power to. So um, that's just something to keep in mind and it is an interesting um, point. So the types of historic designations, I've thrown a few different designations around today. And I think that is where it gets a little convoluted and complicated for a lot of people, understandably. So there's the DC inventory, which is our local um, listing, and there's over 700 sites in it. Now this also includes historic districts and there's set over 70 historic districts with more than 27,000 contributing buildings. So remember when I said that the HPRB handles a lot of design review? Now you see why they do a lot of design review because there's a lot of buildings that are protected that require design review. And then there's approximately 20 historic landmarks with designated interiors. So um, we do have some, uh, some that come to mind are the Northumberland Apartments on New Hampshire Avenue, Alban Towers up in Wisconsin. There's some banks downtown, but really interior designation is not super common, especially when you look at these numbers. And I'm not a math person, but I believe that 20 of 700 plus is, is not a big percentage. And then National Register of Historic Places. So about 600 are also listed in the National Register. Oftentimes, if something's listed in the DC inventory, it's also listed in the National Register. Not always, but generally speaking, it is. Um, but that's why you don't see the numbers match up exactly. And then every few and far between, there's something that's listed in the National Register, but not locally listed. That's another topic. We can, we can do that in historic designation graduate level course. And then National Historic Landmarks, there's about 76. DC just got its most recent National Historic Landmark um, in December when the National Archives building down on Pennsylvania and 7th was designated as a National Historic Landmark. And another thing I like to point out is that just because something is designated does not mean that it doesn't change. Change can happen and that's why we have design review and that's a big part of designation and they're very much tied together. And as I often like to say to people that oftentimes designation is just the beginning at that point, um, a lot can happen from there. And it also requires stewardship of properties. Just because something's designated doesn't mean it's gonna be perpetually protected. It's always gonna take upkeep um, and some love and attention from the user. And then also designation does not regulate use. That is zoning. That's um, something that comes up occasionally, but no, designation does not cover a particular use. You know, I use that that example of the uptown before we we got the uptown designated, but um, that does not require that it forever stays a uh, movie theater in perpetuity. Um, another example of that would be the MacArthur uh, out on MacArthur Boulevard, which is now a CVS. Um, that's the zoning issue. If you're curious about the different designations, you can definitely check out historic sites.dcpreservation.org. This is a site we maintain. Um, and if you go to any entry, you'll go to the bottom and you can see the different designations a property has, whether it's in the DC inventory, a national register, a national historic landmark, so on and so forth. So what are the main differences between the DC inventory of historic sites and the national register of historic places? Well, both programs cover historical and architectural significance, which we'll talk about in a minute, and integrity, the physical integrity of a property and historical perspective. Now, by that they mean, you know, something shouldn't be designated, you know, if a building was built in, I don't know, 2000, it shouldn't be designated, you know, in 2010. That, that's not enough historical perspective. The DC inventory is a little bit more vague about historical perspective, but the National Register is more specific. And they have something called National Register Criteria Consideration G. And this is the so-called 50-year rule. And this says listing possible for a property achieving significance within the past 50 years if it is of exceptional importance. So something can be added to the National Register um, if there was a major event 
or historical um, event rather, or I guess you could say if there was something that was so significant in architecture that they thought it should be designated within a 50 year time frame. But generally speaking, um, designations follow this rule. And you'll go and look at a lot of National Register nominations and you'll see periods of significance that go up to, let's say, 1974, because we're in, you know, we're 50 years now from 1974. So they'll end the period of significance there. And it's because they don't want to deal with this criteria consideration G of exceptional significance. So that's just something kind of interesting. You'll see every once in a while. But yeah, 50 years is generally the rule. So significance criteria. So DC inventory and the National Register have these different criteria. Um, DC inventory goes A through G, National Register goes A through D. But once you start looking closely at this, you'll notice the DC inventory very much mirrors the National Register. You have A and B events in history, which are basically A in the National Register. You have C for individuals, which is B person in the National Register. D, E, and F for architecture and urbanism, artistry and work of a master, which very much correspond to C, design and construction of the National Register. And then archeology span is the match with information potential. That's how it's described in the National Register. There's also the criteria considerations that the National Register has. That includes the 50 year rule, there's A through G. Um, we're not gonna get into those today, but I wanted you to see this, that um, both programs have their own designation criteria but both programs have very similar overlapping designation criteria, just to make things doubly, I mean, doubly complicated, right? So both programs also deal with historic integrity, um, the authenticity of a site. Um, my, my husband will make fun of me because we'll go to a historic site and I'll just say, oh, this site just doesn't have the integrity, right? Um, and I, it's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of, you know, when you see it, but. Um, you know, there's something authentic about, you know, one historic site versus another, or I always think of like Colonial Williamsburg, right? Like there's, there's uh, an aspect of Disneyland-esque there, right? And it's authentic, but also, you know, a lot of it's reconstructed, like the Governor's Palace, things like that. Um, and that's up for debate too, how authentic is that and how authentic was the restoration, different questions like that. Um, but generally speaking, Preservationists think about the character defining elements and these match up with the significance. So these character defining elements very much have to match up with the criteria you see here. And also think about would a historical figure, let's say someone who was in a house in 1950, would they recognize that house now in 2024? And that's just my theoretical question. I'm not gonna answer that question, but um, that's, that gets into the authenticity, the integrity, and the National Park Service has laid out seven aspects of integrity. And so a site could have a lot of significance, historic significance, but it could have really bad integrity. And so that's also a big measure of how something gets listed. And um, on this note, because the National Register has strict standards on integrity, Something can technically be added to the inventory, the DC inventory, but not added to the National Registry because it has integrity issues. Um, I don't know the specifics of the case, but I remember, for example, um, Little Tavern, number 27 was added to the DC inventory back in the, I believe it was the fall at this point, um, but it wasn't added to the National Register. I'm assuming there was an integrity issue there. So this gets into location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. Something else to consider would be, for example, like if something was moved. That's something my husband likes to make fun of me on because I always say, oh my gosh, the structure was moved. That's terrible because that affects the integrity of the site. It affects the feeling and association and the location and the setting. And you think about when I said the historical figure, if something was moved five miles down the road, that historical figure would say, "Where? wait, where is my house? Where? What is this new location? So just some things to think about. The integrity thing can get a little theoretical, but it makes for an interesting discussion. So the designation process in DC. So um, basically what happens is a nomination is put together by a property owner, an agency like um, the Historic Preservation Office could do one, um, an advisory neighborhood commission, an ANC, or community organizations that have historic preservation as one of their core aspects of their mission. So DC preservation. 
So the nomination is completed and um, DCPL does a notification process. We notify the property owners. Um, hopefully we're working with the property owners, but we notify the property owners, the ANC, and then we submit it to HPO after a 30 day period. Now at this point, it sits with HPO for scheduling, it's pending. Um, and they, there's no obligation that they have to hear it in a certain amount of time unless the, the property owner requests it. But generally, it does not have to be heard in a certain amount of time. Um, we have some stuff that's been pending at HPO for over a decade. So the important thing to remember here is that a pending landmark has the same protection as a designated landmark. Does Now, pending historic district, no. But a pending historic landmark has the same protection as a landmark. And if anything's going to happen to the pending property, it has to be heard through HPRB before um, anything can happen once at that point. So um, then a hearing is scheduled and public notice goes out and you know, DCPL will reach back out to the ANC and the property owner and all that to let them know the hearing's coming up, um, hopefully get a letter of support from the ANC. And then it goes to HPRB for consideration. That's where you see the testimony and letters. And then they decide to add it to the DC inventory or not. And then they also decide if they want to forward it to the National Register. So this is the very high level view of designation here in the district. And remember when I mentioned that some cities, you know, something has to go to the city council afterwards. No, nope, not in DC. It ends at HPRB. I wanted to just recount this real quick. This is the Nixon Mount Sea House. This is a landmark I was lucky enough to work on. Um, it has an amazing history and also it's a beautiful building. Um, William, D. Nixon designed this home for his daughter. He was an activist, a community leader in civil rights. And remarkably, he was a self-taught architect, which is just incredible because this is a beautiful example of an Art Deco Streamline Modern home completed in 1950. It's one of the few single family residents here in the city in the style. Typically when you see this style, it's like an apartment building. Um, and it has a period of significance from 1950 when the home was completed till 1962 when Nixon passed away. Um, and it falls in the DC criteria C, D, E, and F, and National Register criteria B and C. I'm not going to quiz anyone, but those basically are the significant individual and the significant architecture criteria. So the landmark nomination was drafted by DCPL in collaboration with the homeowners, uh, Mary D. Garrard and Norma Browd. Um, they were fantastic to work with. It was like, I mean, the reason I'm including this today is this is like a case study in um, working on a property um, designation with the property owner. They were really excited about the home that they lived in since I think about 1979. Um, incredible stewards of the property really cared about it, about the aesthetics, but also the history. Um, in August, 2021, the nomination was co-sponsored by the homeowners along with DCPL and submitted to HPO. At that point, um, I notified the ANC, ANC3D at the time. And then in November, 2021, we got a letter of support from the Art Deco Society of Washington. And then in early 2022, the hearing was scheduled. So I reached back out to ANC3D, had conversations with the commissioner. Um, typically at the stage, I would give a presentation at the ANC and talk about the significance of the property. In this particular case, it didn't quite work out that way, but. I wanted to share this because I thought it was a good example of how the designation process works here in the city. In March 2022, about a week before the hearing, the HPO staff endorsed the designation, which is a very important piece if um, you get their support in a staff report. Um, even though HPRB is the final um, decider on how that works, um, they do heavily rely on the professional staff at HPO, understandably. And so then on March 24th, 2022, HPRB voted to add the home to the DC inventory. And then a couple months later, it was added to the National Register. Um, I would say generally that's about how it works being added to the National Register, but um, this time was particularly fast. Um, I think just because of the level, the, the high standard of this particular property. So um, real quick, I'm gonna talk about creating the nomination for designation. So, I, I said something earlier about doubly confusing. Well, I'm gonna make it doubly confusing again. DC inventory uses the National Register form. Even if it's never gonna be added to the National Register, DC inventory uses the forms from the National Park Service. This is very standard. Understandably, when you look back at the designation history, going back to the National Historic Preservation Act, 
there's been a lot of grassroots from the bottom up, but there's also been a lot of, what's the opposite of grassroots, but coming <laughs> grass tops maybe. But um, the National Park Service has had a big effect on what local preservation programs do in this country and state historic preservation offices. So it makes sense that DC inventory would use this particular form. So there's two main parts of the form. There's the narrative architectural description, and there's a statement of significance, which is the, you could say it's the historic context. Um, and things to consider when you're putting together a form. The function, the use, historic and current. I know we say we don't regulate use, but it's important to know what this building was and what it is now. Architectural style. National Park Service has a long list of styles you can choose from, um, but you gotta get the right one. And then materials. What are the main materials of the property you're designating? You know, for the most part, they focus on the exterior, but it's important to get an architectural description of the interior if you can, and include some photos in the interior. It's important to know what's on the inside, even if you're just designating the exterior. And then there's the narrative description. Now, this is from National Register Bulletin 16A, and I just wanted to highlight a few things in here. And architectural descriptions are tough to write. I mean, oftentimes that's why people hire consultants to write nominations because it can be a little tricky on um, what to include and how to write it. But generally speaking, start with a summary paragraph, a rough quote sketch, describe the building in a logical sequence, you know, from the roof to the front staircase or vice versa, something along those lines. Don't jump around, talk about a window up there and then talk about, you know, something else in the landscape. Um, use simple but clear language and then give its current appearance and describe its original appearance and any changes. That kind of gets into the integrity issue that we talked about. And then I added use reference books and credible websites for guidance on architectural styles and features. I love architecture and I'm always trying to learn new terms and how to describe architecture, but I still have to use a reference guide. There's a lot of complicated stuff out there. And you're never going to know every single thing. And there's always going to be something that surprises you or interests you or you didn't know about. And that's what makes architecture exciting. So get a good reference book. I have some recommendations if you want to know, but get a good reference book. And that will help you with things like this. Significance. This gets back into the National Register criteria I talked about. There's the Statement of Significance Historic Context section, which tells the story of the building or site and explains why it meets one or more of the significance criteria there's areas of significance that the National Park Service has laid out um, from architecture to ethnic heritage to social history to transportation. There's the period of significance, which can be a single year or years. And this is really critical. Um, you have to match, you have the, the years have to match up to the significance of the property. You can't just say, oh, the building was built in 1930. Let's just say 1930 to 2024. It doesn't quite work like that. So period of significance is something that um, a lot of people struggle with and can go back and forth on, and very smart people can disagree about a period of significance. There's the statement of significance summary paragraph, which is your main argument and your key points from the narrative historic context. And then there's supporting paragraphs, making your argument for significance. Why is this property significant? Why do you care about it? Out of that information. Other consideration, boundaries. Boundaries are really critical. A good website to use is DC Property Quest, which tells you the squares and the lots here in the city as they currently are. Um, I'm sure Anne has resources on how to find old squares and lots, um, which is really critical to nominations, but um, boundaries are critical. And then maps and photographs, both historic and current, that tell the story. You know, maybe they show the changes that have happened to the property. I just want to point out real quick, um, National Register Publications, you can just type this right into Google. National Register for Publications, and I'm sure it will be the first or second link. These are really good bulletins on um, learning what goes into a nomination and what to include. And I think if you go to this webpage, you'll also just find some other interesting stuff. There's a really good bulletin on um, historic residential suburbs, which lays out basically the history of American suburban development from the beginning. Um, and they're supposed to provide guidance on how to write these nominations. And as I said, even, even if you're just seeking to get something in the DC inventory, following National Register guidance will get you into the DC inventory. Because like I said, National Register, that's kind of the that's kind of the gold standard there. So real quick, before I wrap up and pass it over to Anne, I want to talk about post-designation and just go over a few critical points about post-designation, which is design review. Design review produces smarter design that is appropriate and compatible. Compatibility is the key word there and accommodates change. 
I like this view I took. Several years ago, I was at room and board over on 14th and T, and this is this view of the U Street Historic District. And I like how you can see the layers here of the different development. And this is a historic district, but you can see that change has still happened. There's new restaurants, new businesses have come in, new structures have been built, and it's a historic district. So it accommodates change, and that's why we have design review. So design review, um, permits are not required for routine work. This is an important piece, not painting, storm windows, portable window units, things like that. Portable window AC units, I should say. When a permit is required, a project impacting a historic landmark or a building or structure in a historic district must be approved. So basically when you're applying for a permit, depending on your address, it will get flagged. And at that point it gets sent over to HPO. And generally HPO views this as minor versus major work. So minor work can generally be approved and reviewed by the staff and you can handle everything right there through the staff. You don't have to go to a hearing. This would be in-kind repairs, roof replacements, quote, unobtrusive alterations, smaller additions. Um, keep in mind that unobtrusive alterations might depend on someone's opinion of what is obtrusive. So um, everything is kind of up for debate, like a lot of preservation, but that's what makes it interesting. And then major work, this is where something is sent to HPRB and you have to go to a public hearing because it's either new construction, larger additions, significant changes, or something that the staff has found to be incompatible, but you still get your due process and go through the hearing process. So when in doubt, contact the Historic Preservation Office. Every historic district has a staff liaison that is happy to answer your questions. And um, if you ever need help contacting anyone, I'm happy to connect you. Um, but I just wanted to go briefly over this and maybe you know, design review is something we should talk about at a future um, session. But um, like I said, designation is oftentimes just the beginning, and then it takes really good stewards to care for our historic and cultural resources. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Anne. Well, Zach, thank you. That was absolutely incredible. A true education um, for someone who is not steeped, in, like myself, is not steeped in historic preservation. So thank you very, very much for, for going over all of that. Um, we're going to hop right on to the next, uh, the next slide. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, live today. And then those who are going to be watching this um, on, the, on the YouTube channel later on, um, we, can, we can go to the next slide, Zach. So I'm here representing the DC History Center, uh, which was founded in 1894, has gone through a couple of different name changes, um, and its mission is to deepen understanding of our city's past to connect, empower, and inspire. And we do that um, through that work through our exhibits, through our library, through our K-12 programming, and our adult programming. Um, the image on the left shows our headquarters. We are headquartered in the Carnegie Library building, which is a designated um, building, um, and the Kiplinger Research Library, which is really the, the heart of the organization, is on the second floor. Um, those of you who are familiar with the Carnegie um, know it's, it's wonderful history. If you would like to learn more, we actually have an online exhibit um, at dchistory.org which goes through um, the architectural significance of the building, the various uses through time, um, and has actually a great uh, timeline as well as to who was actually in the building um, from when it opened in 1903 until uh, the present. And we are uh, co-tenants um, of the Carnegie Library with an Apple store. And the folks who manage the convention center, Events DC, they manage the facility itself. Um, our research library is open by appointment to anyone. You do not need to be a member of the DC History Center. You do not need to be an academic. You do not, do not need to be actually submitting a, um, a, a nomination for a designation. If you have any interest in local DC history, um, we would love to have you come in and make an appointment here at the Kiplinger Research Library. Our exhibits are open Thursday through Sunday. Um, and so even if you um, aren't able to come in for an in-person appointment, um, we do suggest coming in and, and taking in the, the physical um, building itself in addition to our, our exhibits. Um, go to the next slide. Right. So uh, we just got a tremendous, tremendous overview um, from Zach of the whole nomination process. And there was a lot of information um, on each slide for each 
a resource that I'm going to mention or tip or anything like that, every single thing I'm going to mention is referenced in one online site. And that is dchistory.libguides.com. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember dchistory.libguides.com. And I'm going to highlight three particular libguides. Libguides, it's just the platform. Basically, these are online resource guides where we're compiling um, our resources here at the DC History Center. But of course, the DC History Center is not the be all and end all. You are not going to only research to the DC History Center. You're going to be going to the People's Archive over at the um, MLK Memorial uh, Library. You'll go to the National Archives. You'll go to the little pockets of historical research that are available throughout this fabulous, fabulous uh, district of ours. And so um, these resource guides include information about our resources, but also point out to the, the resources of other organizations. So they're a great place to get started. Um, if you're not familiar with our collections, um, how they're organized, what we take in, then the guide I'm going to direct you to is uh, dchistory.libguides.com slash collections. That is, there's an image on the, the left part of the screen, and that will run you through the various um, types of collections from ephemera to maps to photographs to personal papers and business records. Um, and you'll, in going through that guide, you'll see how we catalog them, what you're going to need to do when you're searching the catalog in order to find the information. For example, manuscript collections will have a very short catalog record, but they'll have a link to something called a finding aid. And that finding aid is what you're going to want to click on in order to get detailed information about what a particular collection holds. Um, and so that, that resource guide um, will sort of walk you through how we have organized and made available our collections here at the DC History Center. But the guide that I'm going to talk most about today is the one that's pictured on the right. And this is the DC History uh, Building History Resources Guide. These are living documents. So there are resources that Zach has mentioned, which I'm going to add to this LibGuide after this program is over. Um, a recording of this program will also get linked. Um, the idea here is that um, those who have gone through the process are very often, um, they become experts, right? And so you might come across a resource in your research that you want to let us know about over at the DC History Center. And you could just send that on in via email to library at dchistory.org. And um, we can add it to this LibGuide, which is accessed by folks all over the world, actually. It's obviously not just people here in DC. Um, and so again, we really look at these resources as living, breathing um, uh, uh, resources to help you in your, in your research. Um, there is one other guide. I don't have a picture of it up here, but if you're wondering about how to make an appointment, what do you ask for when you make an appointment, what our appointment hours are, and all sorts of things like that, we have, of course, a LibGuide for you. And that is dchistory.libguides.com slash Kiplinger Research Library. You don't need to remember any of these. I'm sure we could pop um, uh, some of these links into the chat. Um, but again, if you remember nothing else, dchistory.libguides.com. Okay, so with that, we can go on to the next slide, please. I'm going to go over a few, very briefly, a few resources when um, doing house history research um, that folks are going to access. Um, I'm going to start with some that are not actually DC History Center resources, but you can access through our LibGuide. Um, and then of course you can access here um, if you're in the, the Kiplinger Research Library itself. So um, <clears throat> History Quest DC is the online um, uh, interactive GIS map that builds on data from the building permits database. We have access to the database here. If you prefer using an uh, like an access database, we can set you up with that um, here on a, a computer at the DC History Center, or you can go online to History Quest DC and you can um, uh, find out things like the square and lot numbers of a property, the year property was built, who the original owner, owner architect or builder were. Each one of those um, sort of nuggets of information can send you down multiple paths for research. So um, one sort of uh, tip that we, we offer is we have um, on the resource guide, we have downloadable uh, note-taking sheets. Now you might wanna do this all on a spreadsheet on your computer, but if you are um, somebody who retains information by writing it down, um, starting from the very beginning when you're looking through this, um, these are gonna be some of the building blocks that are gonna lead you to um, uh, resources where you can find out more about the owner, the architect, the builder, and that will help build the case for um, for your, your designation nomination. Um, we can go to the next one, please. 
Okay, the Recorder of Deeds online site is, of course, another resource. Um, this is a bit of a cumbersome uh, platform, um, so be patient with it. But if you're looking to see who's owned a property through to across time, um, whether or not there are any racially restrictive covenants on the property, this is going to be um, a, a, a good resource for you. Um, and this is going to be online um, access from uh, images, uh, documents, and indices from 1921 uh, onwards. Um, both of these sites are works in progress. Um, and uh, so if you don't find something now um, and you're still researching a property in a year, check the site again, um, because a particularly history quest is, is one that where they're adding information to it um, uh, as, they, as they go along. Okay, so um, then we're going to go to the next slide, please. Okay, real estate atlases. These are some of my absolute favorite. Now, these are ones which you could consider both an online resource and a physical analog resource. Um, the Library of Congress and the DC Public Library have digitized the real estate atlases which are in the public domain. So uh, our resource guide has direct links to the volume and the years that are available online. And these are beautiful high resolution digital images. I always suggest that people download them and make prints or posters to put in your house. Um, and I think it's also a really great way to visually trace the evolution of a neighborhood through time. Um, so the real estate atlases um, help answer the question about the address, square and lot numbers Zach uh, mentioned earlier that lot numbers and square numbers can change and the real estate atlases are one of the ways that you can trace that back through time, okay? You can see a building's footprint um, and you can again see how neighborhood changes through time. The two images at the bottom of, of this um, slide, one, they're both of the same neighborhood and they're um, from real estate atlas atlases which are about 30 years apart. And you can see just how much more developed that neighborhood became over that time period. Um, the physical uh, real estate atlases are really the way I like to, to, to access these materials. Having the digital files is convenient and it is wonderful for putting the image in the actual report. But in terms of actually working with the real estate atlases, they make so much more sense when you're looking at the physical item. They're huge, they're heavy, um, and um, they're really, really beautiful. And so these are among the resources where it really makes sense to try to come into a library in order to access them. And then use the digital files to sort of confirm information that you've already seen on, on the, the physical. The ones that are not in the public domain are also not digitized. So, um, you know, if you're, you're looking for, we have them up to the, um, I believe the early 1970s. And so if you are, are looking from the 1930s onwards, you're gonna be looking at physical analog real estate maps. Um, the, our resource guide has a, a great sort of step-by-step -step how to um, uh, uh, analyze the, re the real estate maps. And I have to say every single time we walk a, a patron through these, I learn something more about what these can tell you. So they're really, really wonderful resources. Um, let's move on to the next, which is, City directories. Um, so knowing um, for the designation, of course, knowing who lived or who experienced something in the, the building that you were looking to, to nominate is critically important to building the narrative for the designation. And city directories, um, while other resources that I've talked about can tell you who owned a property through time, the city directory who lived in a property through time. They are not foolproof. Um, they were done by survey. Um, and so you you might have somebody who moved right around the time that the survey was being done. Um, but in general, these are, are really incredible um, uh, uh, resources for finding out who lived in a particular uh, location at time or at a particular time, what business was there. Um, the city directories over a certain period of time indicated race. They sometimes listed uh, um, spouses' names. Um, so there really is a lot of information in a city directory um, that um, we might not necessarily have thought of just as a, a telephone directory. Um, many of them have been digitized and are available online. Um, those links are available through our LibGuide. These, again, are ones where actually using the physical city directory is, it makes a, such a difference in your research. Um, rather than going through the digital files that are online or going through microfilm at the DC History Center's Kiplinger Research Library, you're actually looking at the original city directories. 
Um, and and it's it's just a completely different experience, I think, doing that um, than than looking at at microfilm. Um, in addition to the information you might be looking for specifically for your nomination, I love the advertisements. Uh, they really going through these really makes research fun. You know, it's not like going through a white pages. Um, and so, uh, you know, you never know, oh, you might find a reference to a store that you saw listed somewhere else. And then you start researching the store and then you learn about that, um, you know, that building's importance in the neighborhood and you can help build the case. Again, it's, it's sort of like a you know, a, a, a cat with a ball of yarn, you know, you start pulling one thing and all of a sudden there's a, there's lots of yarn all over the place. And that's one of the, I think one of the beautiful things about doing research um, in person um, and not just on a computer um, back home. So um, that's just a plug for coming in and using the actual uh, city directories. So the next few resources that I'm going to go over um, and I'm going to speed up a little bit are specific to the DC History Center. So the ones I mentioned before, those were published resources. So they're either available online, they might be with us, they might be copies at MLK, there might be copies um, at um, a real estate agent's office. But the image, what we're going to talk about now are some of the photographs, which I think are really, really helpful in, in doing your, your research um, on the built environment here in DC. Um, the two citywide um, collections I'm going to highlight are the John P. Weimer photograph collection. This was uh, documentation from 1948 to 1952 taken by a hobbyist photographer, John Weimer, who um, the little map on the left um, is a map of DC that he divided into 57 areas. And then he systematically documented streets within each of those areas. So the entire city is represented. It's not that every block of the city is documented, but the entire city is represented. Then he um, he wrote a sort of a, an assessment of the um, the community um, uh, according to to him um, at the time. Drew a little hand drawn map of the streets he actually documented, and then he created a scrapbooks with amazing captions that go with each one of his images. Every single one of these 4,000 images is cataloged in our online catalog and they are all digitized in high res. This was due to a grant we got a couple of years ago. Um, so if you are looking for um, what you, uh, your building of interest looked like um, between 1940 and 1952, this is gonna be a great res for, resource for you. The next collection I'm gonna highlight, oh, sorry, actually, um, if, you're, <laughs> if you're looking um, uh, to see, to compare, the Weimer image with today's uh, today's view. Then we're gonna go to weimersdc.com, which is a fabulous site a former colleague of mine put together, which maps the uh, original images to what Google Street View captured um, of the site. And so you can go around the city and really see how the, the building either stayed the same or um, how how it, uh, it morphed over time. The next collection I'm going to highlight is the Emil A. Press Slide Collection. Um, this is also documenting uh, neighborhoods across the city. Um, and in one of the reasons why it is such a great resource, it is uh, similar to Weimer in that it was a hobbyist photographer who was taking them. These are not hot Habs quality images, um, but um, like uh, Weimer, he went around the city. Like Weimer, he documented his process. So we actually have you know, the each building's address is um, connected to the image. So it's, it's, it's a really, really meticulously cataloged um, collection. And um, it's also nice seeing things in color. So this is covering 1959 and 1979. These are all slides. And this collection was also, thanks to a grant, fully digitized. Um, we're going to, the next one um, that we're going to um, go over are neighborhood specific photos. So we have a plethora, we have over... Uh, almost 200 individual um, uh, specific photograph collections, and many of them focus on the built environment and are neighborhood specific. Three of them that I'm just going to highlight are the Cleveland Park, Georgetown, and General Architectural Slide Collection. Um, these are uh, 1970s images, all slides, um, and it is obviously covering those neighborhoods. Um, the Susan Myers Capitol Hill Residences Collection, and the Garnet Jacks Southwest Redevelopment Slide Collection. Um, the, the number that follows each of these um, uh, collection titles, the SP and then the number, SP stands for special photograph. So if you see an SP and then a four digit number, that means that this is, an, this is a collection that is organized either by the topic or by the creator 
Um, and it can run the gamut from 50 images to 4,000. So these are really, really incredible um, resources um, that I would recommend you um, take advantage of. And we're gonna go just to the next last slide, which is we've gone over some online resources, some uh, uh, sort of ready reference resources, photographs, um, but there are a plethora of other resources, including published house history research that we have. Um, we have uh, other historic nomination um, uh, forms that have been um, submitted and have either garnered a nomination or not, those often become parts of our collection. So you can see how people did it before. Washington History Magazine, which comes out twice a year, we've been publishing it since 18, uh, 1989, has a plethora of information about the built environment. So these issues here um, include uh, uh, an article on DC surviving alleys, as well as um, this one is the racially restrictive covenants in Bloomingdale. Pretty much every single issue has um, an article relating to the built environment, which may give you a nugget of research to follow. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back on over to Zach and you can take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Anne. That was great. I can't wait to share the, the resources that you showed today with people that, you know, call me and ask about how do I research X or Y or whatever, I'm definitely going to point them towards some of these resources. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you um, as we get a few more questions, maybe, is um, do you have any recommendations on researching more recent history? You know, I, I mentioned earlier how, you know, 1974 now is considered, um, you know, historic. But I find sometimes it could be a little hard finding things for buildings for buildings more in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have some photograph collections um, that I would I would definitely point you towards. Um, I also um, think that the resources of the People's Archive over at MLK um, cover. We do certainly have more recent history than the 1970s, um, but they. Uh, they have a plethora of resources um, that I think would would be helpful. Um, I also think that using, um, we have found in building our collections and finding you know where we are the the right re right sort of repository to take in the information. Maybe there's another one uh, where a collection would be better suited. A lot of people also have collections in their <laughs> homes. Yeah, and so putting out a query on like historic uh, Washington listserv. I'm researching this um, this building or um, uh, you know this neighborhood. Does anybody know of what we call living room collections? Mm. Um, because a lot of the more recent materials, perhaps the person who created them isn't yet ready to donate them yeah. to a repository, right? But um, anybody who is actively documenting uh, the city over the past couple of decades, then there are certainly many of you out there um, they might actually have those sorts of documentation in their homes. So um, that's one of the, I, I didn't mention the best resource of all, which is our librarian um, and our research volunteers. And so writing to library at dchistory.org, saying that you're working on a historic nomination, giving a little bit of background about what you're looking into, we can then connect you with other people that we have come across or other resources that whether or not we have them at the DC History Center, um, librarians can really be some of your best friends um, along this way. Um, and so uh, whether it's uh, Alex Aspiazu, who's our librarian here at the DC History Center, or any of our peers or colleagues, um, use us. That's what we're here for. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that about the living room collections. And this that kind of gets beyond the scope of this conversation today. But yeah, you hear about people that say, oh, I was going through someone's house and we, we threw everything in the dumpster and you're like, wait, what do you mean by everything? Like, you know, yeah, we, we have a lot of good information ourselves that our families have accumulated. So always be a little bit cognizant of that. Um, so a couple questions came through. Um, someone asked about, um, maybe we'll get to it, but what are your architecture reference book recommendation? So the one I use is called A Field Guide to American Houses by Virginia Savage McAllister. Um, I've been using it since graduate school. Um, it lays out a really good history of American residential development and then gets into particular styles starting, it goes way back to, you know, colonial times up through the 19th into the 20th century. They even have McMansions in there. So it really gives you the whole gamut of American home construction. With that said, it can be a little bit harder to find books on uh, commercial architecture. Uh, most books are focused on residential. 
I, I also recommend, you know, if you see, you know, a class from Smithsonian or some other local um, programming about, you know, Western architecture or learning about architecture or something like that, sign up for it. I mean, a lot of a lot of important information comes from obviously knowing Greek and Roman architecture, and that will inform your understanding of how we got to where we are now. So I just recommend always trying to educate yourself and then getting out there and looking at the city and thinking about the buildings that you're looking at. And you'll learn a lot just that way too. And then um, Zach, for the designation request that you said has been pending for a decade, can you tell us why so long without sharing any specifics, of course. So um, it's not just one, there's several actually that have been pending historic districts and um, just different historic landmarks. If you just type in, I don't have the, the I don't know it off the top of my head, but just type into Google pending historic landmarks, DC, HPO or something like that. You'll see the list there and you'll they're by case number and the case number tells you what year. Um, so you'll see several on there. Um, and I really can't say specifics because um, it would have to be a particular case we were talking about. But generally, as I tell people, designation is also kind of like a window of opportunity. And like sometimes there's not really that window open to designate something. Maybe it's going to open later or maybe it's already closed and that's never going to be designated. So there's a lot of things that inform something coming up for consideration or why it's been pending a long time. Um, a lot of, to do with politics, process, whatever it might be, property owners, that's a big piece of it too. Um, so um, it's hard to say specifics, but generally um, there's a lot, a lot of factors that go into that. And I think really the bigger piece that's interesting is the fact that there's no obligation to hear something once it's been um, sitting on the calendar after a certain amount of time, unless, like I said, the property owner requested. And then I think it's 90 days or something like that. Um, don't call me on the exact time frame, but it's something like that. So yeah, great question though. Um, and I think, and I think that covers it. I don't see anything else. Um, and we're, we're right about one o'clock, one or two. So, uh, thank you again. This was really fabulous. Thank you all for, for joining us today and reach out to the DC history centers library at library at dchistory.org. Yeah, definitely. I will certainly be sending people your way. Great. Thanks so much for having us. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.